Hello, everyone. Hey, hey. Um, I think this is also one of my most favorite parts of the service, where we get to chat with people. And one minute is never one minute. Two minutes was never two minutes. But it's great. And I, I'm happy that um, Mark came before me, you know, and he was supposed to speak for five minutes. And he spoke for 12, 13. Well, I come from Ghana. And when we are given five minutes, we take 50. So, so on paper, I have 30 minutes. So guys, get ready. But it's such a joy to be here. Always a pleasure to be here. This stage feels high. I say it all the time. It's such a daunting look. I'm on the set down team, but when you step on it, I feel like, gosh, the anointing is lifting me higher and higher. And it's such a pleasure. I love what Josh brought from 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17, that where the Spirit of God is, there is liberty, and we are free in God's house. This is where we want to be. You know, every Sunday when I'm coming, there's always something. That is the nature of growing up. And when I walk into this place, I know that this is where I have to be. This is where I want to start my week, in church, nowhere else, because God is here. I come heavy and I leave lighter. God blesses me every single time. And so we thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for all that you are and all that you bring. Thank you for today. I pray that today we would hear from you. We will leave here not the same, but we are blessed because we came. In Jesus' mighty name. Everybody say a Ghanaian amen. amen. Oh, you've never been. Everybody say amen. amen. That's it. That's how to do it. So we started a new series from the book of Daniel. And last week we were in Daniel chapter 1. And so this week we're in chapter 2. And we're going to read the entire chapter. It's such a treat to read God's word. The entire chapter. Long, full, the full beginning to end. The technical team have done me a favor by recording it for us. And I'd like you not to listen, but to read along. And then after it's read, after we've all read along, we want to pick a couple of things, unpack it, and hear what God has to say to us today. So Daniel chapter 2, from the beginning to the end. In the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king, and the king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream, and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your houses shall be laid in ruins. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, Let the king tell his servants the dream, and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you are trying to gain time, because you see that the word from me is firm. If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You have agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand, for no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. Because of this, the king was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out, and the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioc, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioc, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, 
Blessed be the name of God for ever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch, whom the king had appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and said thus to him, Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me in before the king, and I will show the king the interpretation. Then Arioch brought in Daniel before the king in haste, and said thus to him, I have found among the exiles from Judah a man who will make known to the king the interpretation. The king declared to Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed, came thoughts of what would be after this, and he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold, its chest and arms of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand, and it struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the king of kings, to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall break and crush all these. And as you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, it shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with the soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage, but they will not hold together, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered up to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly, your God is God of gods and Lord of kings, and a revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honours and many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made a request of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained at the king's court. So today we're looking in chapter 2, what an amazing story. 
uh, quite a dramatic one. And two things we want to pick out, two big messages. See, the theme is facing a changing world with an unchanging God. But two things we want to pick up from chapter two is that one, that God is a limitless God, and two, that he's sovereign over humanity. Or actually, you can actually merge the, the, the one and two, because it is one message, that it's a limitless God who is sovereign over humanity. And we see the king is faced with a dilemma. A king who has a dream, but does not understand what he dreamt. I mean, some commentators are even wondering whether he remembered the full details of the dream. If I were to tell you that I got a message from my brother in Ghana, and um, it was not in English, can you tell me what it means? Assuming I, I pop it up on the screen, and, and you were to see my WhatsApp chat. This is me uh, messing around with Photoshop. This is a mocked up version. And the, the, the bubble in white, what's he saying? Maybe look at my response and hazard a guess. But my brother is a student like most of you, and he's asking me for money. You know, that's what big brothers do. <laughs> you know, send, send me money from the UK, and I have to send him some, cash, some pounds to melt. But you see, the king had a dream, and he couldn't understand it. And he goes on to say that, you know what, let me call the known sources of wisdom. This is beyond me. He calls magicians and sorcerers and, and enchanters and, and all sorts. People who are known. Imagine your day job being, being that you're known to be wise. I mean, how would you walk? You, you walk with a certain kind of air. And so he calls all these guys around and says, tell me what was my dream. But he's not telling, asking for an interpretation. He's asking them a more difficult question. Tell me what I dreamt and tell me what, I, what it meant. Impossible. But you see, he's beginning to see that this is not easy. Already, by calling the magicians, he's plugging into the supernatural. He's calling into, into effort and help that is beyond he and Nebuchadnezzar. But he's not calm. He's actually quite desperate. He's desperate because he doesn't want to be misled. He doesn't want to be confused. So let's, let's turn to verse 5. The Bible says in verse 5, The king replied the astrologers, This is what I firmly decided. If you don't tell me what my dream was and interpret it, I will have you cut into pieces and your houses turned into piles of rubble. Wow. He wants to know his dream or interpretation. Otherwise, this is a harsh consequence. Imagine your boss tells you at work, for those of you who work, that if you don't perform, I'll cut you up into pieces. <laughs> I mean, the, at worst, you get the sack, you know. <laughs> it doesn't quite happen often. But I will cut you into pieces. And then your house, where you lived, will be cut into rubble. This is a king who is early in his reign. It's the second year as king. And he's coming up with this very harsh thing. He needs to know. He's desperate for an answer. So he asks all these wise men, and they're like, no, man, this is, this is not possible. This is beyond us. Let's hear what they say. Let's look at verse 10 and verse 11. Verse 10 and verse 11, the astrologers, they answered him and said, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. Can I say that again? He said, there is no one on earth who can do what the king asks. No king, however great or mighty, has ever asked for such a thing. Or any magician or enchanter or astrologer, um, what the king asks is too difficult. No one can reveal it to the king except the gods, and they do not live amongst humans. You see, they had said a truth. The truth was that this challenge was beyond them. This challenge was a limitation beyond human intervention. Have you ever faced something that you can call a limitation. It's not when the bus doesn't come on time. That's not a limitation. <laughs> it's not when, you know, there's a little bit of a fuel crisis for three or four days. That's not a limitation. Have you faced the challenge that you cannot find an answer? You're faced with a difficulty and you've looked through where sources, known sources of wisdom, known sources of answers. You've typed Mr. Google and he's not responding. You can't find the answer. What do we do when the limitation is before us? And death has been declared. So the, 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 the chief guard goes up with his biggest job ever. He's going to murder an army of wise men. He's going to cut them into pieces, and he's going to flatten their houses. And then the message comes to Daniel. So if you're reading this as a story, as we heard uh, Angus and the, and the team read for us, it is heading to a sure end. Those of you who like thrillers, you can tell that this person is cornered. There's nothing they can do. This is going to be disastrous for the wise men including Daniel and his friends. Last week we heard that they had been recruited into the king's courts. But then Daniel does something. And something happens that begins to change what this narrative would have been. Let's read verse 17 and 18. The Bible says that Daniel returned to his house. 
when he had been told about this challenge, and he was wondering, why, why such a harsh one? And he explained the matter to his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urged them to plead for mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that, his friends, so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Daniel turned to prayer. When he was faced with his biggest challenge, Daniel turned to prayer. But not only did he turn to prayer, he called on his friends who could pray. You know, in our modern day, in our church, we'll call it a small group. Daniel convened a small group, a small group of three friends. And that's why we say belong to a small group, not because we can take the box and say, look, yes, everybody is, is, is attending, but because there is value when you have praying friends. Praying friends are a gift. Do you know, I, I can tell you that the most frustrating place to be in life, especially in my adult life, is to be in a crowd, but to feel like you're alone. Have you ever been there before? To be in a crowd and be like you're alone. To, to, to have people look at you, faces staring at you, but then it feels like everybody's turned their backs on you. God does not intend for us to walk through life alone. And he sends us friends, a community of believers, so that we would do life together. I learned this phrase from my small group. We are not just attending small group. We are doing life because life is a verb. It's an active thing. It's a doing word. We are doing life together. And then they begin to pray. And they begin to pray. I want to tell you just a quick story about, about praying friends. I remember myself in 2015, 2013, uh, September of 2013, 25th September of 2013, Wednesday, 25th September 2013. That's how precise. It was my first day of my first job. Because as a research student, I had had this breakthrough when I was a lecturer at Queen Mary. My first day at work, I got a phone call from my neighbor living downstairs and said, hurry up, come home. That's a problem. See, my wife was two months pregnant with our second child. My f the first pregnancy was textbook. There was actually an app that I downloaded. It says what to expect, what I was expecting. And we were watching it like clockwork. Everything came to pass. So we're like, yeah, we sailed through. We have work experience. The second one is going to be good. And here comes the second one. And I got a phone call saying, we've had to call an ambulance. We're going to William Harvey. I said, what's happening? So I rushed as, much, as quickly as I could. We had been told that Kafi was bleeding terribly because there was a problem with the baby. And not only that, there was a problem with the lining of the womb. It had become so thin, it had ruptured. And there was an area of wounding, and it was bleeding from that area. And so we're referred now from low risk into something called a high risk. We were given a folder and counselors and people to talk to. And we were afraid. But I remember texting my friends and asking them to pray. And two of them came to our house on the Monday. Uh, this was a Wednesday, so the Monday. And we knelt down. I was, I was telling Kafui that I still have that picture. We knelt in our lounge. We held hands together, four adults, calling to God and say, Lord, this is what the doctors are saying. This thing can abort, but we're not looking forward to this. Save this baby. And for the next three months, up until five months, there were episodes of bleeding. They asked us to do scans periodically. And my fear, my confusion was always, anytime we came together, it will be blown away. My friends were standing with me and praying with me. At the 22-week scan, we went to see a consultant. A, a very lovely lady, and she, she sat with us and said, I've got some good news. And she says, look, this is your medical history. These are the images. You know, everything looks black on those images. If you've ever seen a pregnancy scan, if you're not trained, you don't know. But he said, this was the area of bleeding. I still could see only darkness. But he said, now this area is healed. He says, no longer are you high risk, you are now low risk. And from five months to nine months, Everything was fine. I remember the day we went to labor. I said we because I was so stressed. I was in labor myself. <laughs> you know, it's not just Kafui. We were in labor. And Mark, if you, if, don't tell Ken police, but the speed with which I drove <laughs> from Bleen, you've got to shut your professional ear. <laughs> You're, the speed with which I drove from Bleen to, to, to William Harvey. Incredible. But we called that baby Emma. And she came whole. And we celebrated the God who is Emmanuel because he was with us. I cannot say that I was hopeful all through, but I remember so much my friends praying with me. I had a friend called Ken. Ken sometimes watches us, and I'm going to say this and ping him to watch. But Ken was texting me from Ghana saying, prayers are short. Every message he sent me ended with that phrase, prayers are short. Friends, who is praying for you? And who are you praying for? God doesn't want you to be alone. It's okay to go through the storms. Remember two weeks ago, Sunday, the sermon? But when you go through it, don't walk it alone. Call on somebody. I know that sometimes it's easy when I say, look, ask me to pray and I will pray. 
And it's even more difficult for you to ask for prayer and to receive prayer. I want to encourage you to break that, that difficulty, that mold. Ask for prayer. Ask somebody to pray for you. We would love to pray for you. Look to a friend. Find somebody. This is not doctrine. Find at least two or three friends that you know that if ever life became rough, I can text them and say, pray for me because this is God's will. And the Lord came through for us. I love Psalm, Psalm 46 and verse 1, one of my favorite scriptures. The Bible says that the Lord God is our, our refuge and our strength and he's an ever-present help in trouble. I underline the word ever-present. God isn't a God waiting for us at the finishing line, waiting for you to do your best, and then he congratulates you and says, yep, you followed my instructions, I'm here. But he's an ever-present, every step of the way, through the valley of the shadow of death, like we sang this morning. God is with us. He knows your pain, he knows the challenge, and he is with us. Daniel knew it, and so he called his friends to pray. And the, 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 the limitation that he had the Lord will come through for him. We want to see what happened next. God moves. Let's read verse 19 and verse 20. God moves. The Bible says that during the night, during the night, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision, and Daniel praised the God of heaven. The mystery was revealed. Daniel was tested as a wise man in chapter 1, but this didn't come out of his own effort. The mystery was revealed. And Daniel praised God. You see, this verse is also quite significant. When I was reading it, it, it touched me a lot. That you see, when God came through for Daniel, he didn't stand up with the Eureka moments. Those of you who did physics in school and A-level physics or GCSE physics. Archimedes would stand up when he found the answer and say, Eureka, I found it. It was not a Eureka moment. He knew who had given him the abilities. The Bible says that he burst into a song of praise and he said, Praise be to the God forever and ever. How do you respond when God moves for you? Have you ever had a breakthrough in your life or an answer to prayer? What has been your response? I confess that sometimes I even forgot I prayed. You know? But how do we respond when God, pray, when God moves? Is that we respond in praise. And God moves in the face of limitations and that's what no man can do. And his response is a response to prayer. Friends, we see through the story and through the account that God is indeed a limitless God. In the face of a, a challenge that didn't make sense, in the face of danger, of fear, of threat to life and livelihood, in the fear of somebody who's been moved from his home into exile and now his life is in danger again, his life has been in danger twice in recent history. But God has come through for him. Let's move on to the second message, the second big point. That is that God is sovereign. His sovereignty over humanity. So we can tell from the story that God reveals not just the dream, but the meaning of the dream. And he sees this big statue, this big image, this very grand picture of a statue made up of mixed materials. You know, I work next to the British Museum, so I have seen some grand statues. But I haven't seen a statue with mixed materials of gold, of silver, and brass, and clay, and etc. He sees something quite moving. And what Daniel does is that in the interpretation, the first thing he does is to point to the sovereignty of God. He points Nebuchadnezzar to a source of power that he never knew that existed. Let's see verse 26 and verse 27. Verse 26 and verse 27. Daniel asks the king. The king asks Daniel, also called Belteshazzar. This is a big word, Belteshazzar, you know. And says, are you able to tell me what I saw in my dream and interpret it? Daniel replied, no wise man, enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven. Amen. But there is a God in heaven. Do you want to tell yourself, but there is a God in heaven who can reveal mysteries? And this is what he's done. So Daniel points Nebuchadnezzar to a God that he didn't know, to a source that he didn't know. You see, I find this also quite interesting that Daniel didn't take credit. Do you realize that when the, the, the chief guard came and said, I have found somebody. He came and wanted to do a gimmick. He said, I have found somebody, king, who can interpret your dreams. Daniel could have walked onto the stage and said, yep, it's me. I'm the one. I'm the guy who was found 10 times better, but you were wrong. It's actually 100 times better. <laughs> I, have, I have all visions. You can call me PhD. I have this, uh, this prophetic vision, and I can hack into dreams, you know. This is who I am. But he said, no. You know, last week I watched the Bond movie. You know, Martin likes to make references to movies. So if you're a Bond fan like myself, Daniel could have come onto the stage like James Bond and said, 
Like proverbially, like the new titles. No time to die, wise men. I've got the answer. But no, Daniel didn't do that. He says there is a, a God in heaven. This is humility. I mean, have you ever been tempted to take credit for something you didn't do? Have you ever been given more glory and more honor? I remember in my workplace when I first started, everybody used to say, oh, they call me Emmanuel as well, you know. It's not identity theft, it's my first name. It says, Emmanuel, you're such a lovely guy, you're such a nice guy, and I used to enjoy it. You know, I know some of my colleagues will be watching. And, and, and one day, it was a breakthrough prayer. We started praying about influence in our communities and how God should use us to touch the community. And it, it, it convicted me that, you know, I don't want to be known as a nice guy anymore. You know, I, I, I help my neighbors, I pull their bins, I do that. I want to be known as a Christian. Full stop, no more, no less. This is what Daniel did. Not as a wise guy, not as a learned guy, but as a guy who knew God. Full stop. This was his humility. The interpretation of the dream, the imagery, the meaning that comes points to three things. That God is the source of all power, of dominion, and of authority in this world. Let's read verse 37 to 39. Verse 37 to 39. The Bible says, Daniel said, Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power, might and glory. In your hands he's placed all mankind, the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky. Wherever they live, he's giving you rule over them. This sounds like Adam, doesn't it? Sounds like the reference to Adam. Nebuchadnezzar was big and grand, mighty. And he said, but it is God who has given it to you. It is God who has given it to you. And he goes on to catalog that after you would come another king. After you will come another kingdom. Despite the grandeur, despite the splendor, despite your might. I love how Daniel puts it in just the first two words. The phrase in verse 39. He has called him king of kings. We sing king of kings not for a human being. We sing it for God. But he called Nebuchadnezzar king of kings. And right after that he tells him, after you. He's pointing him that you're not going to live forever. Nothing in this world lasts forever. No empire, no authority, no rulership, nothing wise, nothing strange, nothing, nothing that looks outwardly magnificent will last forever. Nothing. I used to have a six-pack. It's no more. <laughs> nothing lasts forever. If you think you, have, you wait till you get married and you're eating some good food, nothing lasts forever. Not even a six-pack. Nothing lasts forever. And God is pointing to him and saying, look, you are king of kings, but not forever. Not just you, Nebuchadnezzar, you are just the head. After you comes somebody, after you comes somebody, after you comes the Medo-Persians, the Greeks, etc., and etc. All the wonderful kingdoms we could ever call on, they would all pass away. Let's read verse 44 and verse 45 for the other significant message. It's not just about successive kingdoms and decreasing power and power that doesn't last. But verse 44 and verse 45, the Bible says that in those times of the kings, as Nebuchadnezzar, and the subsequent kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will not be destroyed. And it will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end. But it will endure, itself will endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. It speaks of Christ. It speaks of the authority of Christ. It speaks of Christ's kingdom that surpasses all. And that Christ's kingdom will come and crush everyone. Jesus Christ came as a king, and he's established his kingdom. When he taught his disciples to pray, he said, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. This is the kingdom that we belong to. It speaks of the present, and it speaks of the future. You see, we are Christians, we are saved, we serve a king, but he's a soon-coming king. There's a time when Jesus Christ will come again, and he will redeem us all unto heaven forever and ever, where no other authority would ever stand. That's what Paul said. I'm going to give you a homework because I'm an academic. And my homework is in Ephesians chapter 1. I'll read four verses for it in closing, and I'll leave you the whole chapter to read for your homework. Ephesians 1, let's read 18 to the end. And this is what Paul was praying that everybody would grasp. You see, that there is a kingdom that surpasses every other. There is authority that surpasses all other. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. My heart, your heart, all of us may be enlightened. That in order that we may know the hope to which we have been called. You, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. And his incomparable great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead. 
and he seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. That stone filled the entire earth. This is Christ. He's going to fill the entire earth. He's going to come and every knee will bow. Every tongue confess. No theory, no philosophy, no, no, no fashion, no trend will be able to stand. There is a time. And we have acknowledged Christ and we've bowed to him. Read Ephesians 1 and grasp this fullness, this mystery of Christ and who we are in him. Friends, Daniel chapter 2 points us to a God who is not limited in any way and he's sovereign over all humanity. I want to end on the note that Martin ended. And it's not, I hope it's not going to be, I don't know if it's going to be a pattern for every week. But if you're feeling that, oh gosh, Daniel must have been so impressive. After all, he had been trained you know, I'm going to be like Daniel. We want to end by thinking that on God. When you look at Daniel's life, his character, everything about him didn't point to him being impressive, but he pointed to God. Everything about Daniel, everything about Daniel points to God. When you reflect on Daniel this week, Daniel chapter 2, think of a God who is great. Think about how he applied wisdom and tact in verse 14. Think of his quiet confidence in God's power in verse 16. You see, the other wise men had asked for time and they had been threatened to be killed. But Daniel was bold enough to tell the king, give me a little bit of time. I'm going to fix this for you. God will work it out. A quiet confidence in God's power. His personal prayer life tied in with the corporate prayer life. We are entering into a week of intentional prayer. Personal prayer life tied in with the corporate prayer life. This week we're going to pray. We're going to pray for one another. And how he walked by revelation, a supernatural revelation. He didn't just move by his sight. And that Daniel was a worshiper. Start your week in worship. When I wake up in the morning, I've got a playlist. Thank God for Spotify. It's so anointed. You wake up in the morning, put on the list, and begin to rise. Otherwise, the world will come over your mind and things will council tax and all these other things will begin to fill your mind. But fill your mind with Christ. And we see his humility. This week, I want to be humble. I want to be humble not because, you know, it's, 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 it's this outward look, but I want to be humble because everything about me should point to Christ. Everything about me, everything about me, everything about me, everything about me should point to Christ. That is humility. That is humility. Because when it points to Christ, it shows your position you are under. You can never point to Christ when you are above. You point to Christ when you are under properly. Everything about me should point to Christ. And it's selflessness. I love the ending that he, he asks for his friends to be honored as well. That is a selfless man. This week, let's step into the week with the encouragement that we serve a limitless God. Let's rise to our feet. A limitless God who is sovereign over every limitation, over every challenge, over everything that we've gone through. We're going to have the prayer team continue to be in the corner where they are the green corner, in their t-shirts. And if you need prayer, please go to them. And we're just going to end in song that reminds ourselves and encourages ourselves about this God. And I don't know what you're going through this season. I don't know what you've been battling with. I don't know what you will call a limitation. But we want to trust God that he's able. I love the song that says that even when we don't see him, he's working. Even when we don't feel him, he's what? He's working. He never stops. He never stops. He never stops working. God is for you. God is with us. So let us pray and let's bring ourselves before God. Father, we thank you today. I thank you for brothers and sisters gathered here. I thank you that, Lord, you are for us. I thank you that you reminded us of your sovereignty, that you are limitless in authority, in power, in might, in wisdom, in dominion. I thank you that you are sovereign over all humanity over everything that we can go through, over everything we can experience. I thank you that you are high and lifted up, far above it all. I thank you that you are above our pain. I thank you that you are above disappointment. I thank you that you are above, Lord, everything that causes us to grieve. You are above it all. And so this morning as a church, as a family, we come before you, that Lord, you will break every limitation. Break through today. 
Like Isaiah 64 says, that rend the heavens and come down. Cause there to be an earthquake and a shaking. Like fire causes water to boil and twigs to burn. Let your name be made known to the nations. Because we are a people since ancient times. No eye has seen or has ear heard. Or has they come to mind that God who moves be on behalf of those who wait for him. So Lord, your people wait for you. We wait in expectation that you are able to do it. Even when we can't see it, you're working. Even when we can't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. In Jesus' name, amen.